<laughs> Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Stay at Home and Brew It. I'm Brock Tornga. And I'm Jeff Perot. Today, we have something special planned for you guys. It's Thursday, and on Thursdays, we get to do Style Highlight. And this week, I'm really excited. We're doing the American Pale Ale, which is a fantastic beer. Um, difficult to make? Very well. Can be. I, I think difficult to make well. Difficult um, to make well. I mean, I, I can remember early on trying to do some pale ales, and uh, yeah, I, I, I felt like I did all right with them. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, I taste, you know, one, one of the commercial versions, and I think, you know, okay, well, I'm, you know, mine wasn't quite there. It was too caramely, or it was too, you know, too bitter on the hops, or, you know, it ended up being too strong because, you know, my gravity got all off or something like that. So I had, you know, I had a number of times where I didn't, didn't quite get it to where I wanted it to, okay. to be. Yeah, so I think those are, are, are common things that would happen with a pale ale, right? I, mm -hmm. I think as a home brewer, I wouldn't get frustrated. Oh, yeah. um, there are some ways. Uh, and I think overall, uh, we're looking for something, um, that's kind of a simple recipe. Um, generally, a, the, the, the more simple that recipe is going to be, mm -hmm. uh, the better pale ale um, that you get, at least in a grain. Correct, yeah. And I, I think it's one of those things which I think I know I messed up early on with making a pale ale was trying to put a whole bunch of extra grains in it, you know? Okay. Um, you know, kind of like, you know, you, we've talked about your, your yeah. attraction to honey malt. Yes. Um, it's kind of the same way. I was like, all right, well, you know, I've, you know, I've got a base, you know, and, but if I throw this in, then it's going to be even better. And then we can know, give it a little this. depth. We can get a little of this. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, you know, I need aromatic malt, melanoid, one of my, one of my favorites, despite what Stubby thinks about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of different crystals. And that's going to be glorious. Absolutely, because we want all of this depth, right? Yeah, and it was not glorious. Generally what happens, it'll just kind of muddy a beer up. And it's okay yeah. to use some of those things in there. I would oh, just yeah. say sparingly and pick one. Mm -hmm. so, something like that. Um, actually, one of, one of my more favorite uh, pale ale recipes, I actually put a touch of uh, Munich in there. Okay. So, yeah. you know, I go with a basic two-row base, and then if there are a little, you know, smidge of Munich in there along with, uh, you know, my... my Crystal of choice. Yes. Which is usually like a 40 or 60, something like that. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, so let's start with our, our BJCP. So okay. uh, the Beer Judge Certification Program is what we use in America to, um, they really are kind of the, the final stay on a style guideline. Yes. Okay. So this is what we're going to use. And if you have any, um, any interest in that whatsoever, I know they're always looking for judges, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really, really neat program. It's run by uh, one of our good friends, James Lalonde, mm -hmm. uh, very knowledgeable um, uh, home brewer as well. And um, they pretty much are going to set the, the standard, right? Correct. Um, and if you're interested in any style guideline whatsoever, a really good jumping off place is to look at the BJCP. Um, and they have, you just go online, BJCP. Uh, dot org. Dot org. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to have the, the most current style guidelines there for you. Um, but it's going to break down all of these beers, uh, give you a brief history, give you a description, uh, uh, what aromas we're supposed to have, what, uh, what mouthfeel we're supposed to have, what, what uh, different hop bitternesses, and also give you some classic style examples. So if you're really wanting to get into doing a, a classic style, that's a really, really good place to start and to look at. So we're going to go over some of that with you guys today. Yeah. And now, as y'all, those of y'all who've been to one of our uh, Style Spotlight episodes before, you know that at the end of this uh, episode, we actually give you a coupon code in which you'll be able to get 15% uh, off. Um, oh, yeah. The coupon code. Oh, the coupon code. Uh, which you'll be able to get 15% off of any one of our uh, beer kits. Ah, Cesar. Ay. Cesar is with us today. Ay, como esta Cesar? Um, Oh, estamos, uh, estamos discutiendo pale ales. Exactly what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, let's, let's, well, let's kind of dive into things. Now, according to the BJCP style guidelines, the description of an American pale ale is a pale, refreshing, and hoppy ale, yet with sufficient supporting malt to make the beer balanced and drinkable. Clean hop presence can reflect classic or, or modern American or new world hop varieties with a wide range of characteristics. An average strength hop for pale, uh, pale American craft beer, generally balanced uh, to be more accessible than modern American IPAs. And uh, traditionally, this uh, lighter in color and cleaner um, than some of the uh, IPAs uh, or regular American IPA. Um, there can be it can be a little bit you know have a little more color to it, but um, usually it's cleaner and less caramely of a malt profile and less body and more and. Uh, 
uh, let's see, less bitterness in, bal in, uh, in the balance and alcohol strength than an American IPA. So the American Pale Ale seems to be a little bit more about, you know, not knocking you upside the face with a, you know, huge amount of malt, not, you know, hitting you in the face with, uh, you know, this massive hot bomb of presence. Sure. Um, but then, it, you know, still wants those American hops, whether it be the, you know, the citrusy, resiny, piney stuff yeah. of kind of the regular seas. So or, the American Pale Ale is kind of the little brother to an IPA, right? At least that's the way I always kind of looked at it. It was like a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you get that pale ale, and then really when you get into the IPAs, you get more of that hop uh, aroma, hop presence. Now, you're still going to have a general, uh, uh, a, a large amount of, of hop characteristic, right? To, oh, yeah. To our pale ale. Yeah, in fact, um, today uh, we brought in, after, after much ado, and at last, we have a couple of examples of the style. In the style guidelines towards the end of it, it always lists what are the classic examples of a beer. And in particular, two of the ones which we were, I was able to pretty well you know, easily get a hold of were uh, Stone IPA, um, which oddly enough, it's considered a pale ale, right? not an IPA, and uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. And so we're gonna, we'll be sampling those as we uh, talk to you school. a little bit. Yeah. Now, I like what they say in here, and I think this is important here. It says that uh, uh, having less caramel flavors than English counterparts. Mm. Yes. So have you had too many English pale ales? I've, I've not had that many. I had a few when I was um, working over in, in London for a summer. Mm -hmm. um, but do you remember a, a, a caramel presence there? <sighs> it's, I mean, I've had a lot of beer since then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and slept once and or sl twice. Yeah. And slept once or twice. So I, I don't quite remember there being a huge caramel presence, but I don't know if, if Nigel's out there watching today, but he might be able to chime in on that for mm -hmm. us a little Kinda bit. Kind of let us know what, the, what, a, what a good style there would be. Uh, but I like that. I think that's a, an important thing because um, generally a lot of times when I, when I get one of these pale ales from someone, it'll be very, very caramely. And I think mm -hmm. that, that, is, uh, that that's kind of unacceptable to the style, right? Yeah. Uh, according to, now some caramel is okay. Correct, correct. I mean, even in, you know, when I'm using a little bit of caramel in mine, more than anything, I'm, I'm using it just to kind of give it a little, a little interesting color to it. Yeah, for uh -huh. sure, for sure. But, you know, as we look at this, um, one of the first things you'll, you notice with it besides, you know, the color, you know, here's, you know, it's kind of, I want to kind of see the, uh, do we got the Tyler cam? I don't know. Shall do we, we have the Tyler cam on today? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's check out the, the color. Down now, a little bit. Okay. Now, this there. one here, so it's kind of a blurred line in between, and even, you know, this it's called the Stone IPA, it's a, it's a pale ale, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a blurred line in between, so it could be a range of colors from anywhere um, this to even a little bit lighter or a little bit darker as well, Correct. Right? And actually, Brock and I, uh, yesterday and today, we're brewing um, actually a pale ale yesterday and a pale ale today mm -hmm. using two new malts that we've recently gotten here at Texas Brewing. And mm -hmm. um, we're doing kind of a test run with them so that we can let you all know about the, the yeah, malt, some, new malts. Some really, really neat malts, too. Um, one of them is, is Stone Path that we're actually brewing with today, or Jeff brewed with today. Uh, we did a pale ale with that. Uh, very, very large um, uh, kernel sizes, too. It's very mm -hmm. plump. Um, and the Stone Path is actually a European malt that is malted here in the States, right? Yes. Um, and it comes in two varieties that we have right now. There's the, the Northeast Gold and the Northeast, Northeast Pale. Correct. And as I understand, the Gold is kind of their flagship, like, two row. That's what I've heard, yes. Okay. And that was the one we actually decided to brew with today. And uh, we've... Uh, well, the sample over here is still a little, little cloudy, but um, <laughs> we can show you the sample maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit later. Okay. Um, so the other malt that we are, um, are that we're going to be having uh, here in the shop uh, available is a, uh, a t an American two row from Malt Europe, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, out of Milwaukee. I yes. think is what they were saying. So old brewing grounds there, um, you know, steeped in that brewer's history, uh, Milwaukee. Oh yeah. Uh, those guys are absolutely killing it up that way. So we uh, we also did another pale ale with that, and, mm -hmm. and they're just their straight crafted. Uh, two row is what they're calling it, right? Correct. Craft blend. Mm -hmm. So, besides the color, I mean, you got a color can be, you know, from very much from. Uh, let's see. We'll go back to the style guidelines here. Uh, it's generally quite clear. Um, yeah, you're not going to have a hazy pale ale. No, right? no, no, no. You would want your pale ale to be as clear as you possibly can can get it. Correct. Um, 
Let's see, so pale golden to light amber. So that's where stock guidelines allow you to go with a little bit of color in it. So, you know, definitely can put a little bit of crystal or something like that in there, but you don't want to go wild on the crystal on this one. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, I mean, it's going to be kind of this kind of, you know, pale golden color. Um, it can even be a little bit lighter. I mean, you can go a little bit lighter in color. Okay, what do they say about the aroma here? Let's start there. Okay, so the aroma, so, you know, you, you, you have it up to your, your, your nose and one of the first things is, you should have a moderate to strong hop aroma, okay. and again, from American or New World um, hop varieties. Can you explain to the people what a New World hop is? I think so. I mean, and, and this is kind of a term which has come about recently. Mm -hmm. um, these New World hop varieties, these are ones in which uh, a lot of y'all are familiar with some of them, in which you've got all kinds of tropical fruit kind of things going on in them, you know, maybe pineapple, mango, the El Dorado, pie. these mm -hmm. newer hops, Citra, Mosaic, those sorts of things Correct. I think would be classified in this New World hop variety, right? Correct. So, and all, they, all they're really doing is stating there, so the old pale ales used to be just sea hops, and generally a lot of Cascade. Oh, yes. Um, there was Cascade in pretty much every pale ale that I ever had from you know, the beginning of this to, uh, to all the way through, really. And mm -hmm. it's a fantastic hop. And I, I would just say people, you know, don't, don't forget about these. The Centennials, no. the Cascades, they're, they're fantastic hops. And, and they've been around for a long time. And I heard Stubby talking that they, uh, they're actually picking them at different uh, times of the year now. And they're getting okay. a lot of different, uh, different uh, flavors and aromas. Really? Yeah, from, so you're getting more of this kind of citrusy, kind of brisk, nice, okay. nice uh, things from these hops, these, these old school hops that we had. So oh. if you haven't gone there lately, maybe kind of, uh, you know, give the, give the new world hops a, a rest and kind of get back to some roots. You really make oh, some yeah. really, really good beers. Uh, recently, I did a, a, a rye PA actually, and I used nothing oh, okay. but sea hops, and it was absolutely glorious. The hop character, so it was like, why don't I use these hops more often? Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm just kind of echo what Brock said. I mean, it's, it's, it, it can, it can become easy to get wrapped up in what is the newest and latest hop. You know, what's new and what's coming out, and you know, I mean, you know, is it as great as Jarillo or is it, you know, something different? And so it can get easy to get wrapped up in that. But don't, you know, as much as you may want to go the route of Jarillo. Don't feel like you always have to go the route of Jarillo. No, absolutely. Experiment just a little bit. Exactly. Although it is a fantastic hop. Oh, it is. It is. You know, but don't be afraid to embrace a lot of those other hops. Like I remember one of the first times in which I had two hearted ale, which oh, is yes. mostly centennial, mm -hmm. I think, or maybe even all centennial. Mm -hmm. And it was a spectacular beer. And when I found out it was almost all centennial, I thought, you know, I was really surprised because I thought, no, 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 I mean this, you know, there's gotta be some other stuff going on here, some new hops, but no, it was all centennial. So, you know, don't miss out on those. It's just a beer hops. that was done very, very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a great thing. So it says here, uh, and, and it lists all this. Uh, uh, this can include citrus, floral, pine, resinous, spicy, tropical fruit, stone fruit, berry, or melon. Mm -hmm. And it says none of these specific characters are required, but hops should be apparent. Low to moderate maltiness supports a hop presentation, which I would agree. There's definitely uh, some, some nice maltiness there, mm -hmm. right? And I would want probably, as we talked about with the blonde, I would want a good quality malt yes. um, to, to back this up. Now, does it have to be American too, Rob? It was interesting you asked that because actually uh, Cedric was asking about that a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, can you make an American pale ale but you know use some non-American ingredients? And you know, as I mentioned a little while ago. You know, one of my non-American ingredients is sometimes a little bit, a little touch of Munich. A little of this or a mm -hmm. little of that. I would say that probably the answer to that question is yes. If you have a favorite malt that you would like to do, um, I wouldn't keep, I would keep the, the hops rather in, mm -hmm. in the American variety. And that's really what we're showcasing here, right? We're not, Correct. we're not allowing 100% of the malt to stand no. on its own. So <laughs> um, now, would you get dinged if, if, if you had entered this uh, German malt um, pale ale into... I don't, uh, I don't think you would. I mean, I think you could get dinged in a competition if if you if you did all Pilsner malt for it mm -hmm. and didn't do like a regular two-row or uh -huh. pale ale malt. Uh -huh. I think because, I mean, Pilsner has a very distinct, distinct distinctly different taste right. than your, your regular two-row or pale malt. Right. Um, so, I mean, if, if a judge is able to detect it, I think you might get dinged there. But, I mean, if you're using, you know, pale ale or two-row, whether it be for Myrex or... Um, Rar or Brees or you know one of those. I think you're fine. I think so too. I, and then you're going to make a good pay land. Oh yeah, uh, with that. So you know, use what you're comfortable with. Now, um, I was going to tell you the the difference between two row and pale ale. Do you know what this is? Actually, I don't think I do. So what would be the difference between two row and okay, pale so ale? Okay, so everything is a two row grain, 
right? Yeah, that's... Unless it's a six row grain. Correct. Which we know six rows is, is completely separate, right? Um, so our two row is just kilned a little bit less than our pale ale. Okay. And that's really the only difference between those two. Hmm. So just so you guys know out there, um, a pale ale and a two row can almost be used interchangeably. Okay. But the pale ale is going to be kilned just a, just a slight bit more. So it can bring just a little bit more color depending on what, what varietal that you're using. Okay. I mean, are we talking quite a bit of color difference? I mean, is it no, like the difference just, between two love bond and like eight or? No, no, not at all. Not okay. at all. We're talking probably a couple of points of a love bond. So, okay. Uh, very, very close there in stature. And you can generally, you can, you can exchange those two things and call it a two row. Gotcha. Okay, look, we got, see we've got Michael Diaz um, watching. We're not letting customers in the store yet. Um, we're working on it hard, trying to get it to happen here soon. And then uh, Ricky Briggs said, uh, just starting out and have the pale ale all wheat kit. Um, what's the best way to add fruit flavoring to it? Okay. Um, well, Ricky, we've got, a, we've got a whole episode on fruit flavorings and how to add it. You might check that out. Um, but uh, tell you what, we'll, we'll get back to you in here in a little bit. Um, we're going to focus, uh, we're going to finish out the style and then we'll, you know, if we have some time at the end, we'll, we'll hit you on the uh, 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 fruit flavoring edition. Okay. Um, so back to our aroma. Yes. Right? So like, you know, with, for instance, with the, with the stone that we have right here, this, this malt character, bready, toasty, biscuity, caramely, it says that small amounts of those things are okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then the esters are going to vary from moderate to none. And I would generally say I would want to use a clean yeast, so I wouldn't want a whole lot of uh, fruit ester from, from no. the, the yeast or any sort of uh, phenolic characteristic whatsoever from, from any yeast, right? Correct. So you need to use a very clean fermenting yeast. Um, US05 is a good one, uh, Y yeast 1056. Um, one of those would actually be yep. really good. Or you could use a bit uh, British strain as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually, and it says that that's completely okay. So maybe an SO4, which is very clean. Yeah. Uh, and it may allow your, your hop to stand a little bit too. So that may be something that you try if you're experimenting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's see, you know, we got, got kind of the aroma there. Um, and then let's see if we look. Caramel flavors are often absent or mm -hmm. fairly restrained but acceptable as long as they don't clash with the hops. Correct. Um, let's see, fruity yeast esters can be moderate to none. Um, although many hop varieties are quite fruity, moderate to high hop bitterness with a medium to dry finish. Uh, this is a, an important thing I, that I, I had a hard time doing at first when I was doing pale ales, was getting that dry finish. Um, when you're mashing this, you're probably gonna wanna mash on the low end um, so that you can, you know, you're not gonna get too heavy uh, of a mouthfeel and of, of a beer, you're wanting to kind of you know make make sure it's very dry and crisp. Right, and kind of on our mash temperatures too, guys. Whenever you're starting to to mess with that a little bit, you're pretty mm -hmm. much looking from 48 to 52. Okay, so and this yeah. is the high end to the low end, right? And you can push it a little bit one way or the other, but generally how it's going to work is if you mash cooler. Mm -hmm. It's going to produce uh, some sugars in there that are a little easier to break down by the yeast. Um, and what that translates into your beer is that you're going to have a little bit uh, uh, drier, crisper beer, right? Because it's mm -hmm. going to go ahead and eat out the, the, those sugars Correct. Um, further down that chain. So um, respectively, on the other side of that, if you're in the, the 52 range, something like that, uh, and makes some sugars, produces some sugars that are a little more difficult for that yeast strain. So it, it's going to be a little... A little um, broader mouth feel, right? It's going to be a little sweeter to the to, to the mouth, right? Yes, and I mean when you start getting into that area, then you you start losing some of the characteristics of a of a classic pale ale that ought to be there, because um, you do. I mean, you want a decent mouth feel, but you don't want it to be too heavy. Um, let's right. see. He's, he's the judges should allow for a characteristic of modern hops in this style as well as classic varieties. So, if you're picking up on a whole bunch of candied pineapple or something, El Dorado would be okay thing to put in your in your pale ale. It's mm -hmm. a new world American hop. Correct. Now, are you getting any um, any uh, maltiness uh, from this this beer we're having here? This was the stone. This is the stone. Um, very clean. It's very very clean. I'm not getting. I'm not getting too much. I get a little maltiness, definitely. Um, the mouthfeel of it is there. Uh, again, very clean, very, very crisp. Yeah. I get some maltiness, though, in the uh, in the taste, however. Um, not so much in the aroma. The aroma is very, very, very crisp. Mm -hmm. How about the hop aroma? Are you getting a whole lot of that? I am. I'm getting a lot of piney, resiny stuff. 
to which I think is, is kind of a uh, kind of a stone thing, right? Um, yeah. And I'm getting a good amount of bitterness from this as well. I am too. This one, th although stone is stone IPA is is part of the uh, um, style category or style, you know, is part of this uh, recommended style category or style examples. Um, I would say it leans more to an IPA. Yeah, I would too. Um, it means a little heavier on the hops. Um, definitely a little bit heavier on the malt. Which Stone is known for. They are. Uh, moderate to high carbonation. I definitely <laughs> would would give this some uh, some good volume so that you have that, that white head that sits on there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, overall smooth finish without astringency or harshness. So pale ale or malt, typically North American two row. And here it says that American or yeast uh, Ale yeasts are, are okay. Mm -hmm. Neutral to light fruity. All right. Um, dry hopping isn't very common with this beer, um, from what I've seen and, and what I've done as well. Um, you can do it, but it, in the guidelines it mentions the idea that dry hopping, if used, used, may add grassy notes, although this character should not be excessive. So be careful on the whole dry hopping. Um, yeah, and again, we don't want any haze in there. No. And generally for us home brewers, that dry hopping, you know, can add a little bit of haze. Yeah. Um, if you guys are kegging, I think this would be a great style to, to throw a little uh, gelatin in the, in mm. the keg oh, yeah. and let it really, really clear up. Um, a little bit of gelatin goes a long way in cleaning a beer up. It really, it does. really does in, in the keg. But, okay, so getting back to the style guidelines, um, let's see, we've got the carbonation stuff. Um, Let's move on to ingredients. Let's let's talk about making one. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's talk about ingredients. So as we were mentioning earlier, you'd want a very good quality pale ale malt, or you know, a two row. Jorge um, has something to say here that I can't understand. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, I got a little. Okay. Let's test in your Spanish. Ah. We have. Okay, um, Jorge. Um, aquí tenemos todo lo que usted necesita para para um, para construir su cerveza. Tenemos ingredientes: levadura, um, cebada, ah, cebada, cebada malteada. Sí. Um, tenemos uh, uh, lúpulo también. Uh, tenemos todo todo el, uh, todo lo que usted necesita para para hacer cerveza, si usted quiere. Um, si, si usted quiere, puede uh, llamarnos o también puede mandar un, un email y uh, podemos ayudar a usted en uh, haciendo su cerveza. You got her? I think so. Okay, cool. Si tiene más preguntas, All dígame. Right. Let's get back to, uh, to our ingredients okay. here. Um, now I'm going to go and I'm going to make this. So we have two uh, kits in store here for mm -hmm. pale ales, right? We have an El Dorado pale ale, mm -hmm. and we also have a Galaxy pale ale. Yes. Um, now, how far off are the grain bills on this? Are they the same grain bill? Um, let's see. The Galaxy is, uh, looks like, 8 pounds uh, IRX Pale. Okay. 10 ounces IRX 40, uh, 4 ounces IRX 10. Okay, I think the only difference here is that the, the Pale Ale on the El Dorado is up to about a half a pound. Okay. Um, so we have very similar uh, hop um, additions here as well. Mm -hmm. um, the El Dorado is split. Um, maybe to get a little bit more of the uh, the aroma. Um, so I've got a 10 minute and a one minute addition on, okay. on a half an ounce in there. Um, but generally I think that's gonna be pretty close. Now these ones have some crystals in it. I actually uh, have a recipe um, and my pale ale has a little bit of honey malt in it. <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> So I have mostly, and I do 10, 10 gallon batches. So I got about 16 and uh, almost 17 pounds of, uh, of Irix Pale Ale is what okay. I like to use because I just really like the stature. It's got good head retention. I actually put a little bit of Spitz malt in there as well, just, just for a little bit more because my Pale Ale, I like to have that, that white you know, head that sits atop that mm -hmm. thing. Um, this thing here was probably my favorite craft beer for ever and a day. I can't tell you how much of this Sierra Nevada. When uh, was the last time you had one? Not that long ago, and okay. I think it's changed. Okay. I think it has changed um, quite a bit. So a little bit of spitz malt and just a little bit of honey malt, which mm -hmm. the BJCB style guidelines say that are completely acceptable to have in mm -hmm. there. Um, that I didn't go over on. I didn't want this thing to be super, super honey. Um, and I actually used, uh, 
go figure. I used Citroen Mosaic. Okay, so you went the okay. New World hot variety. I, I definitely went New World. So I wanted mine to be kind of a grapefruit pale ale. And those okay. two hops together, um, when they're used kind of side by side, can really put off a, a strong kind of a citrus, but more grapefruit kind of a, a, a smell and taste to it. Um, now, I didn't want to add any flavoring to this. You wouldn't want to do that with your American pale ale. True. But we started off with actually some first ward additions mm -hmm. um, of each. Okay. Um, and then I had a 30 and a 15 of the two different, and then I did two five-minute additions right at the end to really punch that that nose. Okay. okay. And I upped my, my mid-range ones. I used I wanted it to be bitter, so I made sure that that was kind of my my amount was, was more there in the, in the middle of it. My first ward, I really just kind of wanted to get in there so we could have some of those in. Um, kind of get that before it came up to a boil. Okay. I actually put my first wort hops in during my collections of, of my extract. Okay. Um, so it's not quite up to temperature. So you're still gonna get some of that, uh, some of that aroma and some of that flavor, even though you're gonna boil this thing for 60 minutes. Okay. Uh, but it came out really, really nice. I've done this recipe a ton of times and a lot of people like to drink it. Uh, but that's it, no crystals. Hmm. In there, Interesting. all I used was the the pale ale, and the the honey actually darkens it up uh, uh, enough to where it really looks like a pale ale. Yeah, because the the honey is sitting what around about twenty five. Yeah, about twenty five. Okay, so yeah. Oh, interesting. Anyway, just another little approach, so you can kind of go all over the place with it. We have two very different mm -hmm. uh, pale ales right here, and the only difference really is going to be the hops. Mm -hmm. So something to kind of check out if you're experimenting and, and, and going on with that. So um, ingredients wise, definitely use a two row mm -hmm. or, or a pale malt like you were saying earlier. I wouldn't use a Pilsner. Correct. And for, as for adding specialty grains such as crystal malt or as, as Brock does honey malt, you want to use some, some restraint with them. Very um, much so. If anything, it's kind of to add just a little bit of, a little bit of character to it but you know, don't go over overboard. So on this five gallon here, I mean, it's got 10 ounces of crystal 40 and four ounces of crystal 10. So okay. we're not even talking a full pound of, uh, of crystal malt in there with an eight and a half or, or a uh, pound base. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you, Jeff. Yeah, no, no, it's, and so of, uh, let's see, for other things, let's see, um, if you do use some specialty grains, uh, BJCP guidelines say use grains that add malt flavor and richness, light sweetness, and toady or toasty or bready notes um, to kind of you know differentiate yourself. And I mean, there's there's different brands which will have different characteristics. Whether you know you're using the honey malt or different crystals from um, Brees or, or uh, Irex or or somebody else. You get a multi character out of the Sierra Nevada. I am. I am too. Yeah. And you can see this color on this. I don't know if you guys can see the difference between these, but it definitely is a little bit darker. Mm -hmm. I would say that there probably is a little crystal in this. Could be. I mean, I, there, I mean, because there is like, if Stubby was here, he'd walk in and say, that's Scott. Probably so. They better everything with Magnum. And <laughs> but it's, it has, yeah, it has like a little bit of a, I, I get like a little bready toasty thing going on in mm -hmm. the background. Absolutely. Um, from both the taste and the, but it's not caramely. No, no, it's not by any means. And it's dry. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a little sweeter, I think, than the uh, the stone representation. Um, this was a little more crisp. This had a little bit of a sweet mouthfeel, so I say it was probably mashed on the sweeter side. Yeah, probably. Somebody from Stone's gonna call us and say, or from Sierra <laughs> and say, you guys are you, you guys are nuts. You don't know you what you're talking about. <laughs> but um, I definitely get uh, a little bit of. Uh, in the hops, I'm definitely getting some fruits. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's an estuary thing or, or what's going on here. So I'd have it, I've had it in the past, and I'd say this is probably a better, more fresh representation of it than I've had recently. Years ago, my buddies and I, we did a tour of Sierra Nevada. And um, they actually, the recipe for what's in the Canon bottle, as opposed to draft, is slightly different. Uh, they were telling us they they changed it just a little bit because they said they found that they were, they noticed that if they tweak the recipe slightly, and they wouldn't tell us what they did, but they it's a slightly different recipe for the draft as opposed to the cans and bottles. I wonder if it's a stability thing. I bet it is longevity in the bottle for whatever reason, or maybe it uh, maybe it changes a little bit. And that's something you guys can think about too. You know, I've made this beer. This beer is wonderful this week, and I bring somebody in to uh, to try it, and the beer has completely changed. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to happen. Uh, you know. 
definitely in your bottle, but uh, in your keg as well. Um, so don't get discouraged by that. No, no. So let's you know let's talk. We we, we talked about mesh. We talked about ingredients mm -hmm. um, and you know types of hops to use. And you mentioned kind of you know when you hop. Um, this would be this would be one actually where you could do kind of the classic you know 60 30 15 mm -hmm. um, yeah. hop additions because we definitely want a little bit of a bittering hop in there Correct. right um, so we need something in there that's going to give us those bitters um, and then I really want to hop a, a aroma and profile especially on the new world hops I, I would say uh, I, I want to taste there I want to smell that that candy pineapple in there if I put that too close to the boil that's 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 all going to go away correct I'm just going to get the bittering from that right mm-hmm and so, I mean, yeah, it would be nice to kind of have, you know, some of those as a little later hops. But, you know, this is one which you could easily go with a very classic hopping schedule and be perfectly fine, too. So, do you have a, a good pale ale recipe that you really, you lean on, that, um, you, that, you, that you like? Do you have a story? Well, I've got, let's Jeff see. Jeff's stories are the best. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, I got one. Let's see if I've got it on here. It was back and some nun said, why don't you use a little some of this in there? And <laughs> so we did that and it was amazing. Uh, let's see if I have it in here. So um, guys, we'd like to hear about your, uh, about your pale ales too. And again, uh, we, we just like to hear from you um, in general. We're here at the shop. Uh, if there's any questions about any of these styles or any of these kits, um, you know, please call us up. I would just say, to uh, to experiment yeah. um, with these things, uh, oh. and and again, kind of use that. What's up, brother? No, I was just to say. So I told y'all a couple uh, a couple days ago about we did a come and brew it where. Um, did you want to try? We it? had Macy Moore on. The best thing that I think I, Macy said about a pale ale is, if you have to think about it too much, you did it wrong. Mm. Okay. If you drink the pale ale and you have to think what hops are in this or what, it's it's overdone. You've okay. overcomplicated it's, it's too it. Too complex. And when he said that, all of us on the show were like, damn, that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to overly comp think about it too much, you've done it wrong. No, I So that, that's I, now what I keep in mind every time I brew a pale ale, every time yeah. I drink one, keep it simple. Oh, yeah. Don't I overcomplicate it. very good advice. I think, uh, actually, Sandra had a really nice pale ale, didn't she? She had a great show? pale ale. Uh -huh. can, can you recall what was in that? Do you, do you remember offhand? Knowing her, it was Sabro. I'm pretty sure it's Sabro and Eldorado. Okay. Okay. The, they'll be doing that yeah. on the big system at Panther here. Oh, really? Oh, oh, that'll, oh be nice. yeah. that'll be Yeah, that one's definitely in the works. Okay. So. Awesome. Pretty, uh, do you remember the uh, base or the base recipe for the It was uh, Planet, uh, yes. okay. a touch of 40 and a touch of 60. Okay. I think it was like 9, nine 10 pounds base malt, uh, half a pound of each, okay. somewhere around in there. Okay. okay. Super easy, um, mild bittering, all late edition. Really easy, really well done. So that might be something for you guys to consider okay, thanks, as well man. while you're while you're picking some uh, some grains. Um, Muttons actually has a new varietal out called Planet, um, which is a very very uh, modified malt. Uh, mm -hmm. The extract value is very very high on it. It's easy to use. Okay. It clears up really nice too. Um, and what it is is about halfway between like a, if anybody's ever used like a Maris Otter. It's generally, mm -hmm. what what do you think of when you use Maris Otter? Uh, the kind of the whole toasty biscuity thing that uh, comes through. Sure, through kind of in your face, mm -hmm. very, very bready, very, very full, yeah. right? Um, so it's about halfway between that and a regular, uh, like, two row pale, okay? Um, so it, it is called pale ale, it's just called extra pale, or excuse me, pale planet. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an extra pale variety, which is a little bit lighter as well, which is kind of neat. But it's about halfway between the two and your flavor profile. So you can get a lot of body out of this beer. Hmm. But it doesn't have the astringentness or the uh, astringentness or the huskiness that the Maris Otter would have okay. um, to it. So, interesting variety. Hmm. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of guys are using it, but that might go well in in a in a pale ale Actually, as long as that. you stay to your American hops. Yeah, so yeah. we can still call it American style, mm -hmm. right? Um, Cesar says he is brewing uh, a pale ale tomorrow. Uh, pale ale malt, Crystal Forty, some Carapils, and Cascade hops. Um, sounds like that ought to be a good one. Classic old school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So I think that'll be a, that'll make for a fantastic recipe. Oh yeah. But yeah, that yeah. Just watch your caramels. Yes. Um, if you're doing Cesar, uh, if you're doing five five gallon, uh, you know here there's less than a pound of caramels in this too. And if you're using forty, you might even want to back that down just a, just a tad, huh? Yeah. I mean just just a smidge in there. 
Um, well, well, you mentioned what if I have a pale ale recipe that's kind of a standard, and I do. Okay. Um, so we knew there was one. Area. Oh yeah. Um, now, I'm, how many times have you made this beer? Um, I don't know. Quite a few. <laughs> okay. And okay. I've experimented with different hops and different hopping schedules sure, and things sure. like that. But I use 75% um, just uh, two row. Um, I use about 7% Munich and then uh, just like 4% Crystal 40 and then the rest is some wheat malt, just white wheat. You put wheat malt in there? Just a little bit of wheat. Okay, so why, is, why would you put wheat in there? The reason I did was I really wanted to make sure I had a really good head. Okay. And I put just a touch of wheat in there just to ensure that it have, you know, the, the big thick head that I, I kind of wanted to have with it. Now, would, uh, would that lend a problem to any kind of clarity? Um, when you're using wheat in small percentages, no. Okay. Um, and I was, I mean, I'm Such a using, small percentage there? Yeah. I mean, I'm using, you know, way less than 10%. I'm using about, like I said, about 7% wheat. Okay. Knowing um, what you know now, would you substitute that for a spitz or for a dextrin? I might. I might, actually. Or would you stay with the wheat, you think? I might just go ahead and go with the, the spits. Now, in that small percentage of mm -hmm. wheat, would that mess with your, with your mouth feel at all? Would that, would that uh, give you a, a more full body to it? it? Not much. I mean, it, it does a little, okay. perhaps, but it doesn't, affect, it doesn't affect it as much as I think if I was to go on a higher amount of wheat. Plus, I usually mash this right around about 148. Okay. All right, so restrain, restrain, mm -hmm. restrain. Correct. Um, and how about your your, uh, your hops? Hops, I use a mix of some classic sea hops along with uh, some New World. So I'm using uh, some Chinook, uh, Idaho 7, Mosaic, and Cascade. Okay, all right. Lots of citrus stuff in there. Oh, yes. All right. And the Chinook for bittering? Yes, the Chinook is all for bittering at the beginning. Okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a huge fan of the flavor and aroma of Chinook. Um, it's all right, but I mean, I, I was much more, I much more prefer those citrusy, even some of the New World kind of fruity hops that, that can go in there. Okay, I've got a question here from uh, from Casey, and he's asking about what malts are good for head retention. Um, and Casey, we've 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 kind of gone over that a, a few times, um, kind of just here and there. We've we've never had a show on that. No. Um, if you're concerned about your head retention or if you're not getting some, uh, Irix makes a spitz malt, it's a dextrin malt that we had talked about. It imparts no flavor really in small amounts to your to your beer. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even about a half a pound for a five gallon recipe would, would increase your head intention. You can go up from there a little bit if, if, if you need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not gonna give you any flavor and it's not gonna give you any color. There's no, hasn't been kilned in that, uh, in, in that way. Um, mm -hmm. But it will increase it. What, what it does is it makes those those sugars, those dextrin sugars, right? They don't uh, attenuate out through your yeast. And so for whatever reason, that translates to that head stability on, yes. on your beer and retention. Um, now there are gonna be some malts. I've had really good, the, actually the Irish Pale, mm -hmm. just straight up, I did a smash with it and the head retention was absolutely unbelievable. Really? On there. Yeah, I've had okay. really, really good luck with that. Um, and with the Pale Planet as well, did you have you you've used that Pale Planet quite a bit? Do you yeah. get a good retention on there? Yeah. Because yeah, I know you've done some smashes yeah, and stuff. Um, but if you're ever concerned about that, uh, just a little bit of spitz malt in there or some uh, some carapils. The, the 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 Germans call it spitz malt. It's just a dextrin malt. Yeah. Uh, it's the exact same thing as a carapils. But as Brock was saying, don't be afraid to to try it even without it. Um, some of the malts are very very, you know, are able to you know just. You know, a regular two rows uh, uh, you know, able enough just to to give a decent head. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't don't go throwing in uh, carapils or spitz malt just because you think you have to. Um, you try it without it one time, see how it is. You yeah. might be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, no, and, and overall the malts are so modified now. I mean, these are all things that go into the genetics of, of the varietals that are picked. Um, the genetic strains in these malts that there's all kind of taken under now uh, the under modified stuff where we really had to put something in there for that specific reason are, are kind of starting to go away yeah uh, which is exciting yeah so don't be afraid to try it now we haven't talked yet about fermentation yeah fermentation um, so you know lots of flexibility with hops and hop schedule um, you know you don't want to go too hoppy because you know I mean you need to make sure you've got you know, a little bit of, you know, some balance in there so you can still kind of taste the malt. Um, you don't want to lose that. But now for fermentation, I mean, let's say, you know, we've 
we've made our beer, you know, we've mashed it, boiled it, put in our hops that we've carefully selected, and we get to fermentation time. Okay. Um, we mentioned earlier that probably using an, uh, you know, an American ale yeast is probably the, the ideal thing to use, mm -hmm. but could also get away with an SO4. Yeah, and it says American or English ale yeast, uh, mm -hmm. neutral to lightly fruity. Um, would be just fine. So anything like that that's going to just yeah. a cleanly, a cleanly not only attenuate, but also look at your flocculation level. You don't want something that's going to flock out of your beer, and that just means that your yeast is going to slip out of suspension. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're looking for something super, super nice, super clear, super oh, yeah. clean, right? Correct. And so you, you'll want something like that. I, as I've usually tell, told you all in the past, I, I usually start off cool. I usually pitch cool and then kind of warm up. Um, I'm usually fermenting mine right there, you know, when it's hitting its peak. I, I'm usually fermenting around 66 to 67. Okay. All right. But how about you? Uh, my magic number's always been 68. Okay. Yep. I love that right at 68. If, if you have a possibility to, uh, to control it now, if you don't, just find the coolest spot in your house. It's mm -hmm. going to be a dark area in which it's not going to be, uh, um, you know, disturbed something like that um, and you should be fine your yeast will still work in that little bit higher range now you wouldn't want it in a place where the sun's coming in and the uh the temperature is fluctuating a whole lot no uh, if there's a problem because i've talked to a lot of home brewers and they're like oh my roommate comes home he he cranks it down and then like when i'm away at work you know he, he has it way up and so i've got this this range mm -hmm. if you can you can kind of smooth that out somewhere or get yourself a fridge or something where you can mm -hmm. put a, a temperature control on that. Uh, ultimately, your, your, your beers are going to thank you for it. Yeah. Um, I don't remember at what point it was, but it just it clicked. It's fermentation control actually is a very, very important thing. It is. And I mean, it's when I got when I when I when I had the ability to suddenly control my fermentation temperature, it made a world of difference in my beers. And along those lines, if you have a uh, chest freezer out there that you're looking to get rid of. I know Tyler's been searching for one, um, so let us know, and Tyler will be grateful. Tyler, you're not the first person I've talked to that's had problems finding these chest freezers, so I don't know what happened during COVID. Everybody was like, oh, we must have meat, and we must have it frozen. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Which is always smart to have, right? Yeah. Probably should have had that anyway, so. Probably. Probably. But, you know. But I have noticed there's toilet paper everywhere now. There so. is. Plenty of TP. Uh, turns out uh, everything would have been just fine, right? Yes. Yeah. So now, is it is it necessary, Neely, to, um, I know that you always kind of start cool and, mm -hmm. and, and ramp up, and, I, and you like to ferment your beers cooler all the time, right? Yes. That's that's kind of, that's that's your way. That's, yes. That's the, the way of the, the Jedi, right? <laughs> so now, can you tell it's the people way of the pirate. why, oh, the way of the pirates, even better. <laughs> Uh, can you tell people why you like to do that? What, what sort of flavors, what, what is that going to do to your beer? Sure. Um, what I've found that it does with my beers, and the reason why I like to start cold, or, or cooler, not necessarily cold, mm -hmm. is that I found that when I did not, that my beers um, didn't come out quite as clean. Um, I, like, I like a really clean, crisp tasting beer. Um, now, what do you mean by clean? Are you talking about uh, clarity? Which no, that's a good question. I mean, I don't, I don't want a whole lot of fruity fermentation esters in it. Okay. Um, some, yes, you know, I, I do want some in there, but um, which is why I don't go too terribly cold. Mm -hmm. But for me, I found out I, I, I feel like I, I get a cleaner beer mm -hmm. um, in the sense of not, you know, not an overabundance of those fermentation um, esters and, and phenols can kind of come out. Sure. And so, for me, it's been a way of avoiding a lot of those. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the, 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 the I remember a crazy Belgian that actually did very well in competition um, got excellently down to 55, and we we started fermentation of it at 55. Um, that's what actually what won first place at nationals. Oh, so, fantastic! And won a Stein at Blue Bonnet too. Hey, this <laughs> might be the way. <laughs> Uh, no, but so, I think I think it's a very important, uh, a very important thing to to think about is is where you're going to ferment that beer at mm -hmm. in, in your temperature. Now, if there was something that you wanted to kick, like mm -hmm. say we're doing a half or something like that, and we've we've done a style highlight on that as well. Um, um, different yeasts do different things at different temperatures, right? Correct. And generally, if you do a little bit of digging, you can find out, you know, through the you know the manufacturer, the yeast itself, what happens 
if I ferment this at, mm -hmm. at this temperature? What happens if I ferment at this temperature? And sometimes, like especially in that half, like uh, on the cooler side, you get the clove side and less of the banana. On the hotter side, right. you get a lot more of that banana, um, that uh, that phenolic kind of characteristics here, those esters in there. Um, so that's going to be the same for pretty much every E strain, right? Oh, yeah. Even even on a, a very very clean one, a USO five or a ten fifty six, you're still going to get some yeast from that, right? Oh yeah. In fact, if you look, I mean, if I'm going on a little bit of a foggy memory, if you look up ten fifty six on Yeast's website, it actually will mention the idea that the warmer you ferment it, the more of uh, those fruity, citrusy things are going to come out um, of, of the yeast during fermentation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you want to be able to make sure you're accentu uh, accentuating and emphasizing those, then you might want to go ahead and do it a little bit warmer. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that's good advice just so that you, uh, you know, that you're, that you're paying attention to it. Yeah. You know, is, is a good thing. Everything that we can do, Jeff, to, to, to take a step to, um, you know, not to, not only does it give us more variables in our beer, but it also gives us more uh, more weapons in our arsenal. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, really be thinking about your style of beer. We're just going to do a pale ale. We're just going to do a pale ale. Well, there's a lot of things that go into these pale ales, right? We've talked about a lot of things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and any step that you can take the, to increase the quality in your beer, but do it intentionally. Yes. You know? Um, sometimes you make a mistake, it's the best mistake ever, and oh, we got to do that every single time. And I always tell people, take notes. Um, have a recipe list. Take notes on everything. Take your measurements. Write down what, what temperatures my boss. <laughs> what was going on behind me here? Yeah, he gave you rabbit ears. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but be intentional about it. Uh, write it down. Uh, you know, check it out. And then if something comes out fantastic, you're, you're going to be able to, you know, to reproduce that beer um, in, in just that way. Okay. What do we have here? Uh, Christopher is asking, when you use a fermentation chamber for temp, temp control and a temp controller, what is your suggestion for the temperature probe on the temperature controller? Do you put it in a glass of water, tape to the side of the carboy, um, thermal well? Just curious what you guys use. Well, I know what you do. <laughs> yeah. You tape it right to the ferment. Correct. Right. And I think that that would work pretty well. Um, now, I know a lot of people that just put it in. I wouldn't just put it in inside in the, in the air. No, because then you're reading the air temperature inside of that cooler, and it's not going to kick on, kick off at, at the temperature in which your fermentation is happening. Correct. Um, if you have a chance to use a thermal well, absolutely. Then that, mm -hmm. that, that brings that, that thermometer or that um, uh, thermostat right to the middle of your fermentation, right? Correct. Um, which is a great thing. Um, and so, I mean, if you can use a thermal well, I mean, and I've, I've, I've not used one before. I don't have one. Um, but, I mean, I've had good luck with just taping it to the side of the, of my carboy. Yeah, for sure. Now, what if I've got three beers going in there? That's when it becomes a challenge. Okay. Because either you need to have them all uh, fermenting at about the same time um, and with similar strains of yeast, uh, or you're going to get some perhaps weird things going on in a few of your beers because you only have the probe stuck on one of them. For sure. Um, at the very least, I would put it in a bottle of water. So then at least it's it's reading what liquid temperature inside of that fridge is going to be. Yeah. Now, give or take for your fermentation control, it's still better than nothing. Correct. And Christopher, the reason why I tape mine to the side of my carboy is, you know, kind of the same thing of why you would use a thermal well. With the idea that, you know, as Brock was saying, you want that temperature probe reading what uh, the wort is sitting at or what your beer is fermenting at. Because if we're shooting for 63 degrees, and it's taped to the side in my fermentation, fermentation's gonna heat up your, your Correct. beer, right? So if, if that heats it up then, my thermostat knows I don't have to kick on for a minute, right? Exactly, and not a lot of people, I think, realize that, that as the yeast is beginning to reproduce and you know, eat all those sugars and do all that stuff, they're producing heat. And so the, you know, the, the more you, know, you can get that, ther that uh, little temperature probe in contact with um, what's going on in there, the more accurately your fermentation chamber is, is going to be able to adjust the temperature so that your word is or your fermenting word is staying at the right temperature. Now have you looked into any of these tilt uh, hydrometers? I have not. I mean I, I've I've seen little things online about them but I, I don't have one and I know um, Stubby said that he was he was thinking, thinking about, about bringing some in. Yeah. Yeah. Interested to see what you could do with that. Um, okay if you tape it to the side do you put some padding on the outside of the probe to insulate the probe along with tape? 
good question. Good question. A lot of times I try to do that. Um, what I will do, if I can, is I'll take like an old rag or, you know, you know, an old towel or something like that. Or even I have some old t-shirts that, you know, I, I'm, you know, have seen better days. And I will put the probe there. Usually I take the probe first and then I take the small piece of towel or cloth and then tape that over it. I usually use the blue painter's tape because that's easier to take on and off. Yeah. Um, it's not going to provoke, you know, produce a lot of sticky mess it's been on there for so a while. So definitely your thermal well is probably going to be the best way. If you get that temperature probe on the inside of your fermentation, if not, um, again, the thing that worries me is, you know, it's on there, yes, but we have the back side of that that's just reading the air temperature now. Yeah. So. No, I, I understand. You know, I, I, I would just say find, find what works better for you. If, mm -hmm. if, if, if you, you can even take a, you know, you can take a temperature reading of your fermentation. Um, they make some great uh, little laser guns and stuff. Oh, yeah. You can see exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's matching, and you can, you can kind of come up or down on your temperature control on the outside there to kind of um, try to you know, solidify that, yeah. that temperature range a little bit more. But at the very least, yeah, put it in a, put it in a, you know, in a glass of water. Or a, I've seen people use like an Ozarka bottle and just, yeah. so it's a little less, too. <laughs> less difficult to spill. Um, but yeah, great question. Paper towel, pocket blue planer's tape. Hmm. This is what Sandra does. Okay. Sandra is a brewer at Panther Island. Very cool. All right. Um, let's see. So we've covered fermentation. Um, Can you all start carrying the Omega Kabayak? Actually, Joshua, we have uh, plenty of the Omega Kabayak. Yeah, got a bunch the, of it in the today. All the boss and the hothead. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have any more of the Lalaman, the dry? I think we're boss? We are out of the Are dry we? boss right now. That yeah. went really, really quick. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I used it. I, I got really great results. I was going to let you know, I got a text updating me. So it was Planet, Rosewood, and Munich that Sandra used. A touch of Centennial to Bitter, and then Eldorado and Sabro. Okay. What is the Rosewood? The Rosewood is the 40. 40. And then she added a, a touch of Munich, and I think that gave it a little little more dimension. I, I think that's what set hers off than a lot of our others, is she used that little bit of Munich that yeah. gave it a little something different. Yeah, I like doing but, a little bit of Munich in there. Yeah. Not much, yeah, just a bit. And, and I don't know, she'll probably let me know here in a second how much she used, but I know it was probably like a pound or so. It was a real little bit. That was her first beer that she did over at Panther, and it's still been one of their most popular ones, so we keep hoping that once COVID blows over, that it'll be done on the big system. Cool, so, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. We'll yeah. look forward so to she, that. So she sure. said, I, I know her well because I did know it was Sabro and El Dorado. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's four o'clock. I think we should probably wrap things up here. Um, it's, it's a, it's Five o'clock somewhere. 1072, 18, 18 hours. Oh, we're talking about uh, the Kabai strains. Okay. Um, so maybe that's another. Another show we should do is goodbye extremes. Yeah, we probably should. But um, all right, so kind of wrap some things up. A uh, couple, you know, things to, to keep in mind when you're making your pale ale is using, you know, good quality ingredients. Don't go crazy on the caramel. Um, use, uh, you know, use anywhere from the classic American hops to even some of the new ones. Um, you can play around with hop schedule and amounts, but you know, try not to go too crazy much. Uh, it's not necessarily one you want one you want to dry hop. Uh, mash it uh, low. Um, you know, around 148 to 152, and ferment it with a clean yeast, and bottle or keg that thing, and enjoy the heck out of it. Uh, Gene was asking if we sell the laser temperature, and we don't, Gene. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, we don't have those. And Josh, you got to get to brewing, man. It's uh, it's 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 time to get off the uh, get off the pot, man, and do it. Uh, Get some more fermenters, man. Oh Be yeah. Today, tomorrow, and brew out through the weekend. You got four of those recipes done. Yeah. We just did. Uh, we did. We've done two in a row now. Mm -hmm. um, we have one for tomorrow to round out our, our our three pale ales. So what we did, guys, is we got all this new malt. We wanted to brew with it so that we can explain to you guys what we have and how to use it. These sorts of things. So, um, so we did the exact same recipe with a different base malt. Mm -hmm. And we didn't use any caramel, we didn't use anything. We just used the two row and a little yep. bit of spits. I think we put a little spits in Casey for the head retention, just a skosh, right? Yes. Again, no color, no taste, no nothing is coming out of that. So our pale ales are, are, are coming straight from the, the base malt. So this is something you can do too. You don't even have to have that crystal in there. Well, and to kind of show you a little bit, um, we've got, what do we do? Uh, El Dorado and Idaho 7 on this one, I think, yes. right? And these are actually samples from both of them. 
Um, okay. This one's still clearing up. Yep. But this was... So, uh, and, and this is wart. This okay. is just this, the wart. This isn't the finished beer. So you no. can see we still have a little bit of proteins in there. I don't know if you can see that on there, Tyler, or not. Um, so this is going to be our... This was the Malt Europe, right? Yes. Two row right here. And this Very is the, golden color. It's this definitely is the stone cleared path. Up. And the stone path looks like it's got a little bit of a lighter stature to it. I can tell you both of these were absolutely delicious. Uh, they, they smelled fantastic yeah. in the hallway. But this one was very, it smelled like it was fresh baked bread when I walked in. It was like, ooh, somebody's brewing and it smells good. <laughs> uh, so I'm excited to see. But you can see, I don't know if you can see the color difference uh, between these two uh, or not. But definitely a little lighter stature in, Just a little the, bit. Uh, in the stone path. Um, but fantastic protein break in both of them, huh? Mm-hmm. This protein's just, just coagulated up yeah. and, and, and are dropping out now, so um, fantastic. All right. Fantastic. Okay, it's time. All right, it's time for the code. Time for the coupon code. And our coupon code for this style highlight, Jeff, is going to be 15 pale. That's 15 P A L E, all caps, right? And that'll get you 15% off of all pale ale kits. All of our pale ale kits, and that's for our extract kits or our all grain, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this expires 626 20. All right, so you got 10, or no, less, you got about a week. You got about a week. Yep, he's given you about a week. The powers that be, our director of operations, Mr. Jones. Um, so, yeah, get that. Then. Again, that's 15PALE. Put that in the coupon code, and you can have 15% off any single pale ale kit that you mm -hmm. want to do. Uh, get out there and brew it, man. It's, um, it's the deal. Joshua says, I can't wait to come down to the shop, and we can't wait for, for that either, Josh. In fact, let's... Uh, we're, um, we're sorry, guys. We're, uh, we're, we are working hard to get this shop open. We, we, we really are. Um, there's kind of been some a, a resurgence here of... Um, of this COVID thing again. So yeah. I, I think everybody's just still kind of a little bit on shaky legs here as much as we would love to open these doors and blow in. But we're just worried if one of us uh, kind of comes down with something, it would absolutely shut us up. And then we have to close our doors completely for two weeks and we wouldn't be able to get you all these products to make the beer, uh, which we're going to do our best guys any possible way that we possibly can to still service you to do as many things as we possibly can to uh, to get these products to you uh, in any fashion, right? Whether you pick them up or whether we ship them out. Correct. Um, which right now it seems like the shipping is working fantastic and we still have free shipping for anything over $49. So uh, a kit and a yeast and you're, you're, you're at that, that dollar value. So yeah. we'll put in a box. You'll have it tomorrow. That's the thing. It is before four o'clock. Um, Anything else, Jeff, you can think about? Not that I can think about. So thanks for joining us for uh, this Style Spotlight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we appreciate all your support, your orders, and uh, your patience with us as well. And like Brock said, we're trying, to, we're trying to get it so that we can open it up as soon as possible. I think it's a high spotlight. Is it a high, high spotlight? Yes, it is. Style Spotlight. I'm just saying, it's a highlight to me. To you, it's a spotlight. <laughs> it's a spotlight to me, too. It's a spotlight uh, to Tyler. To Tyler. And that's two against one, but I'm still going with highlight. <laughs> So thank you again for joining us for this Pale Ale Highlight. Next Thursday, mm -hmm. we will have another style highlight for you where we'll delve deeply into these beers. And I actually kind of like this that we made a few. Yes, me too. You know, maybe we try to do that. Okay. Uh, would be fantastic. So um, you guys uh, you guys be cool out there and, and, and keep, the, keep the experiments going. Keep, keep brewing your asses off. That'd be fantastic. So, um, as always, stay safe. Stay at home. And brew it. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.